As we kick off today's OTC Markets Group Investor Day, I'd like to share that today's presentation may contain forward-looking statements. For more information, please refer to the cautionary statement regarding forward-looking statements included in our presentation materials. We have an exciting program for you today, which will begin with opening remarks from our President and CEO, Cromwell Colson. Welcome to our OTC Markets Group 2022 Investor Day. I'm Cromwell Colson, President and CEO of OTC Markets Group. It is my pleasure to kick off today's event. As I reflect on what our team accomplished during 2021, I am excited for the opportunities that lay ahead of us. 2021 was a record year for our business. The results we achieved reflected strong client-focused execution, increased product demand, and our commitment to meeting higher regulatory standards across our markets. Gross revenues surpassed 100 million for the first time in our history, up 45% from the prior year. Our earnings per share increased 65%. Each business line contributed to the company's success as we pursued our mission of creating better informed and more efficient financial markets. 2021 marked the fifth consecutive year of revenue growth for OTC markets. Our financial stewardship allowed us to deliver 49% growth in capital return to our shareholders. We operate a service business making consistent investments in our people and platform to provide useful solutions for clients. With a focus on long-term progress and thoughtful management of operating expenses, we are well positioned to build on our recent success and deliver sustainable value to our shareholders. Our strategy remains focused on driving revenue growth by enhancing the capabilities of our core trading services, market data, and corporate services business lines to provide greater benefits and operating efficiencies for our subscribers. We strongly believe that our future is predicated upon supporting the collective success of our clients. We are committed to delivering on four strategic initiatives. First, commercialize our regulatory role under Rule 15C211 to create new opportunities for companies to be public and enhance our technology platforms so that broker dealers can efficiently and compliantly trade more securities. Second, advocate for additional regulatory recognition of our markets to increase the value of being publicly traded and remove market inefficiencies. Third, pursue corporate development efforts to grow and diversify our product suite and client base. And fourth, drive sustainable revenue growth across each of our business lines that increases per share earnings power over the long term. Throughout our history, OTC Markets has increased the level of transparency in the market and improved the availability of information for investors, brokers, and regulators. We believe that competitive markets thrive in daylight. We play an expanding role by supporting critical trading infrastructure that improves the integrity and price efficiency of financial markets. The implementation of amendments to SEC Rule 15C211 in September 2021 represents a culmination of these efforts, building a strong base for the future. This was a complex effort to deliver for broker-dealers and public companies the infrastructure to support Rule 211 compliance. Our on-time delivery reinforced over a decade of enhanced regulation that began back in 2012 when OTC Link LLC was established as a FINRA member broker-dealer and OTC Link ATS as an SEC-regulated alternative trading system. Regulatory modernization, increased responsibilities, and recognition of our data-driven disclosure standards form the foundation of our public markets. We are now recognized as a regulated market operator and a qualified interdealer quotation system. Our role as a qualified IDQS allows our broker-dealer subscribers to rely on our publicly available determinations, which eases their regulatory burdens, increases the number of securities available to trade, and supports a more transparent public market. With three distinct markets, the OTCQX Best Market, 
OTCQB venture market and the pink open market, we inform investors and give public companies a stairway of standards to climb as they build their businesses. Our markets can accommodate the needs of companies at their infancy and through maturation with tailored standards to support a diverse range of industry leaders and market innovators. Collectively, the OTC market provides companies with a gateway to become public and the building blocks to establish themselves as good corporate citizens, inform investors, and demonstrate their compliance with securities laws. Last year alone, we saw over 200 companies join our OTCQX market and more than 400 joined OTCQB. Each market finished with the highest ever year-end count of companies and securities. We take tremendous pride in this milestone and the relationships we've established with over 1,500 companies that choose to trade on these markets. Our corporate service team continues to build on this momentum, educating companies across the UK, Western Europe, Australia, and the Nordics on the differentiated value proposition our premium markets offer to international companies. Our OTCQX and OTCQB markets are effective solutions for engaged global companies seeking more efficient access to the US capital markets by digitally distributing their disclosure data and governance credentials. Beyond corporate services, strong growth in users and the expansion of our real-time data and compliance products remain a priority for our market data licensing business. We continue to add US and international distributors of real-time quotes, broadening the reach of our market data to a wider audience of institutional and retail investors across the US, Europe, Asia, and Canada. We also recently announced our plans to acquire Blue Sky Data Corp, a leading provider of data on Blue Sky rules and regulations. This acquisition will result in a fully integrated product suite that provides a holistic, comprehensive view of Blue Sky's secondary trading compliance. This unique data offering will help our broker-dealer subscribers and public companies improve their compliance and understanding of state securities laws. Our goal is to deliver this information in the most efficient format for broker-dealers, financial advisors, public companies, and regulators in both the equity and fixed income markets. Collectively, our three distinct business lines form a cohesive, mutually reinforcing offering to a broad range of market participants. We generate diversified revenue streams, providing a stable foundation for growth. We benefit from a subscription-based revenue model with over 70% of our revenues in 2021 coming from subscription-based arrangements that are recurring in nature. Over the past year, we have managed a substantial increase in customer demand for our corporate services products, driven user growth in our market data business, and handled record trading volumes on our ATSs. We have demonstrated our ability to provide reliable platforms that adapt and grow in lockstep with investors, broker dealers, corporate clients, and our broader community. Today, you will hear more from members of the senior leadership of OTC Markets Group as they discuss strategies for managing our business lines and the growth trajectory of the company. I look forward to your questions and the opportunity to provide further context at the end of the next discussion. Thank you, Cromwell, and good morning, everyone. My name is Christy Harkins, and I'm the Chief Marketing Officer here at OTC Markets Group. I'm pleased to be joined by Jason Paltrowitz, our EVP of Corporate Services, and Dan Zinn, our Chief General Counsel. Gentlemen, to start things off today, I just want to kind of expand upon our overall performance, which Cromwell touched on. So Jason, I'll first turn to you. If you could just talk a little bit about the key drivers that you saw in the business last year and what led to our overall growth. Sure. Thanks, Christy. I think there were two key themes for last year that led to our growth. First is obviously COVID. Um, you know, what we saw through the COVID crisis was companies really trying um, incredibly hard to reach out to U.S. investors. Uh, you saw tremendous 
disconnect between valuations around the world and companies in the US. And you saw primarily out of Australia, Europe, Canada, companies trying to bridge that valuation gap. Being able to access US retail investors was really pivotal in being able to do that. The second thing would be around uh, the 211 regulation that I believe Cromwell touched on. Um, you know, Companies were now forced into a situation, or not forced, but wanting to be in a situation where they were providing timely disclosure to their US investors, US investors that are so important, as I just mentioned. So we saw a tremendous amount of companies coming to us wanting to be open and transparent, meet US securities laws, and, and provide the most disclosure possible in order to be on our market. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, in terms of the specific key drivers, that's exactly right. And, and to me, the point is being prepared for those kinds of events, mm -hmm. right? So extreme volatility and uh, more volume in terms of trading. Right? We, if we didn't have our OTC link ECN in place, we wouldn't have been prepared to take advantage of that piece of market structure and that piece of how uh, business sort of grew last year. Similarly, Jason referenced 15C211. That was a long time of working with the SEC and working with our industry partners to get that rule implemented and get us to a point where we could have a service for those companies that wanted to remain compliant uh, and stay on our market. And I think all of that tied together in terms of drivers to just put more focus on the market and more focus on what we do, mm -hmm. which really drives our market data business as well. Mm -hmm. The more people and the more um, entities that are interested in the kind of data we provide, the more that market data business can grow. Right, really kind of creates that cycle or that flywheel effect of each of those business lines kind of driving the other one. And exactly. We certainly you know, talked a bit about, in Cromwell's remarks, about the changes to 15C211. Um, I think one of the things we often get asked by investors is, OK, so that had a big impact in 2021. What does that look like moving forward for the mm -hmm. business? I mean, I think it really is important to reference how long the process was prior to 15C211 being implemented. Uh, in September of last year. And really what happens when a rule like that comes into place is this mad rush of activity, which we saw and, and Jason referenced in terms of US companies really wanting to ensure their compliance, but those compliance rules stay in place. So for all of the companies that, let's say, joined our disclosure and news service in order to be able to reach their investors and put out compliant disclosure, they're going to have to continue to do that in order to maintain compliance with the rule. Um, and I think as we continue to show the benefits of being compliant and having a public quote, uh, the number of companies that are interested, the, the types of companies that are looking at our markets is only going to grow. And so you'll see that impact over time. It won't be a, a single event like mm -hmm. it was last year, but it will be this ongoing sort of focus on that part of the market. Yeah, and I think when you look at corporate services, you really have to remember the world is our oyster, so to speak. Um, you know, there's tens of thousands of equities around the world most of which want to access U.S. investment, and most of which want to be and maintain compliance to, to the rules under, under 15C211. And so for us, as we grow the business out in the future, we're looking at new markets. Mm -hmm. um, we're looking at um, you know, new companies that are coming to market in their own countries that are going to want to access the U.S. Um, we look at our virtual investor conference series as a driver. That continues to gain, gain traction as more and more companies, you know, are looking at travel budgets, but still want to be access, be able to access those investors. So we're really just at the tip of the iceberg. If you think about the the number of countries and companies um, that we can provide services for, and so that really helps kind of amplify or answer that question um, in terms of what the company's growth trajectory looks like as we move forward. Yeah, I think to some degree it does, right? With a specific regulation like 15C211 and some of the specific points of focus. Um, and more than that, it's continuing to do what I referenced earlier, which is remain sort of ahead of the curve. Uh, and so when we have a strategic plan for enhancing the kinds of services we can offer our broker dealers, that comes to fruition in the form of something like OTC Link ECN, which then is able to step in and provide a real needed service uh, when volatility and volume raise like they did last year. That's going to be part of how we continue to grow going forward is remaining in touch with our subscribers mm -hmm. and understanding what their needs are going to be going forward and then being able to execute when the time comes and when those needs arise. Mm -hmm. And certainly I would think for you, Jason, just bringing some of those companies into the OTC news and disclosure fold under the pink market sort of then allows you to amplify and look at how you really elevate those companies into either our QX or our QB markets. 
Yeah, you know, it's interesting. We've really transformed from, you know, what I would call a nice to have, right? It was really more about how do you access U.S. investors and part of it being an investor relations strategy. For most companies around the world now, in order to kind of have the right market here, a must have. Um, and as we're engaging with those companies, primarily through the disclosure and news service, they're seeing the opportunity that our premium markets afford them and, and want to kind of upgrade as they go through the process. Going back to that virtuous cycle or, or the circle, the more people that are trading, the more volume that's going through our platform, the more people that are taking our market data, right? We've started to see interest out of Asia. The more companies are starting to see that. And really, it just feeds the demand for issuers wanting to, to be on our markets. So as I said before, it is the tip of the iceberg in that we're really focused on certain key regions. And now we're going to continue to expand out uh, from there. And I think one of the other interesting points that we should touch on that, that Cromwell mentioned was the um, announcement that we've recently signed uh, a deal to acquire Blue Sky Data Corp. Mm -hmm. um, so I think maybe, Dan, if you could just fill us in a little bit more about what that means um, for the market data business, but also for how we think about the business overall. Sure. I mean, on a granular level, what that does is provide us with state level compliance data that really complements what we're already doing through 15C to 11 on a federal level. So for a broker dealer compliance department um, or a clearing firm compliance department, having a view into both state and federal law and how companies are complying and how securities are complying with those is going to be a nice additional offering. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I think on a broader level, it speaks to what we're able to do when the market becomes educated about the services we provide, mm -hmm. which is really a lot of what Jason was referring to earlier. The more we become that touch point, the, the more interest there is in our market data, um, the more likely a broker-dealer compliance department is going to look to us for some of our compliance analytics data, for some of the other offerings that we have. Um, and the more educated the people in those compliance departments become, uh, the more comfortable they become with things like differentiating OTCQX and OTCQB from the pink market, and just having a better understanding of how our market structure operates. So it's, it's a seemingly small piece of the puzzle, mm -hmm. uh, but it actually has a, an effect that will really be outsized compared to the, the size and scope of that particular business. Well, and really continues to speak to the journey that we've been on in terms of becoming a, a regulated entity and having that both federal level um, regulation, but also then the state level regulation that's kind of competing and putting that puzzle together. Sure, it's, it's for us, uh, 211 really represents an inflection point of some, some sort. And I think the, the Blue Sky Data acquisition just adds to that, where now the industry and even regulators are looking to us as the source of this information um, and as a reliable kind of regulated market that they can really understand and, and grow with. And I think, again, that just feeds the issuers because they're being told um, by their investors, by the broker dealers that they're working with, by their advisors and their investment bankers that there are now key standards in the U.S. You know, that companies need to meet. Um, there's disclosure requirements. There's state securities laws. There's all of these things that companies need to think about, not as necessarily um, limiting institutions from taking investment, but if you want to broaden and diversify your shareholder base as much as possible, you need to kind of tick these boxes and be mindful of, of what you're doing. And it, it all just feeds into growing that, that issuer business. I think we'd be remiss if we didn't just sort of mention or, or talk a little bit about some of the outside factors that affect our business overall. I mean, certainly there's quite a bit going on, whether it's from an economic level, a geopolitical level. How do you think, Jason, about those kind of sets of issues and how they impact our business over the long term? Well, it still certainly creates volatility and uncertainty. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things through my 20 plus years of a career, right, uncertainty is opportunity. And where you have volatile markets, you have companies that are looking to reduce that volatility. Broadening your shareholder base, diversifying your shareholder base, adding a retail component to your shareholder base is a tried and true um, way in which to kind of bridge that gap or to minimize the volatility in your stock. So we're still seeing, even in this uncertain time, um, you're still seeing issuers, you know, reaching out and wanting to to join our markets in order in order to do that. From a geopolitical standpoint, you know, obviously I don't know that I have the answers or, or Dan or you. Um, we don't know where those things are going to go. Um, but what we do know is the financial markets are still important. What we still are seeing is that from the SME, the small and medium enterprise space, 
um, being able to be in the U.S., whether it's in biotech or fintech or clean tech, um, being able to access U.S. investors and uh, investment is, is probably more important than ever as certain parts of the world are a little dicey. Um, and so, you know, it, it's a lot of uncertainty, but so far, so far so good from, from a business perspective. Yeah, I mean, the experience of dealing with a global economic events is not that dissimilar from dealing with COVID, mm -hmm. right? And it, it does drive retail investors to either take more action or at least demand more information. Um, those impact our trading services business and our market data business. Um, it drives companies to make sure they understand how they're interacting with investors. So to Jason's point about how our markets can help companies in those circumstances, Right, it's, it's almost for us less about the specific geopolitical event or the specific macroeconomic event um, and more about making sure that when those things arise, um, we have the ability to communicate with our subscribers, um, for Jason and his team to talk to companies, whether they're on our markets now or are thinking about it, um, and leverage our services to be able to get through whatever bump in the road or, or sometimes much larger than a bump in the road mm -hmm. um, appears for them. And you mentioned sort of the ways in which we help companies. And I know that one of the things that's near and dear to your heart is continuing to help companies and really make sure that the, the legislative agendas and that those regulatory agendas are really helping our issuers as well. So maybe if you just give a quick couple of thoughts on some of the key regulatory pushes um, that we're looking to make sure. this year. I just look at it as fun trips to DC, but I like that you framed it. No, I, um, I, I think a lot of our legislative agenda is really driven by what we hear from the companies. Mm -hmm. Um, when we convene things like the OTCQX Advisory Committee and hear really from CEOs and CFOs that are experiencing life on the OTC market, um, it's wonderful to hear what things are, are important to them. Uh, one of the biggest ideas that we got out of that group in those conversations was this concept of how companies on our markets can offer employee stock ownership plans, mm -hmm. uh, which is really a way of giving employees access to the economic benefit of a growing public company that has access to public market. Uh, the rules have been outdated for a long time, and they treated companies on our markets like private companies as opposed to the public companies that they really are. Uh, and so we're happy to say that just last week, the, the House passed uh, the SECURE Act 2.0, which is a sweeping bill that deals with a, a number of retirement uh, fund issues, but includes a provision that would, um, that would modernize the way that rule works mm -hmm. and allow uh, companies on, on the OTCQX market in particular to offer ESOP plans on par with how their uh, their peers on an exchange would do so. We have a long list of, of regulatory uh, asks and, and things that we think would level the playing field and really focus on the merits of the company, um, making sure that people understand the OTC market has transparency, has easy to access market data and all the rest. So another key driver for us is margin eligibility, which really just boils down to being able to hold an OTC security in your margin account and borrow against it the way you, you might um, a security listed on an exchange. Again, it sounds like a small piece, but every bit of recognition we get on Capitol Hill in particular uh, that shows how our markets are really providing the same kind of public service uh, that people have grown to expect over the years, uh, that really does allow us to then take a step further and a step further and so we could do this for, for hours, but I'll, I'll pause on those two in terms of, of key drivers. Well, I know those are certainly both issues that are near and dear to, to your heart and to, to those of our clients as well. Well, yeah, you know, it's important to recognize that while we talk a lot about the growth being international, we have a sizable U.S. business and, you know, things like Reg A or, you know, SPACs or, um, you know, anything that allows a, a domestic security where we're the primary market to feel and look more like um, an exchange counterpart really adds a tremendous amount of value, certainly helps growth as a company. Um, but, you know, the exchanges aren't always right sized for a lot of the companies that still want to be public and want to support their shareholders. And so being able to to address some of these regulatory inefficiencies between the markets are, are really important, not just, again, for our growth in the company, but for these companies. Um, you know, we're a company on our market and a small company. We face these issues as well. And so I think it's important that we kind of fly the flag for those, those companies that we support. Thanks, Dan and Jason, for today's discussion. 
We will now transition over to our Q&A session where you'll have the opportunity to ask questions of both Jason and Dan and the other members of our senior leadership team. Thank you. Great, we've got everybody uh, in the process of just logging in to join us for our Q&A session. Um, just as a reminder, at the bottom of your Zoom screen, there is a Q&A module, which will allow you to type in and ask questions. Um, and our goal is to get to as many of those as we can today. Um, and if we aren't able to get to your questions, we'll certainly have your contact details and we'll be able to follow up after we have gone through uh, the ones that we can get to. Um, so as we kind of kick things off with, with this portion of the program, um, Matt, I'm going to direct the, the first question that we've, we've had come in is towards you. Um, Jason touched a little bit upon some of the trends that we were starting to see globally, but hoping you can expand a little bit more on sort of where you see growth coming from at a global level from a market data perspective. Sure, Kristen. Um, yeah, we're continuing to see, you know, uh, opportunity and interest from the, uh, from the retail sector internationally. Um, so, you know, uh, activity has tailed off a little from the peak of COVID, but there's still a lot of opportunity there, especially in Europe and Asia. We see that sector uh, growing and we're seeing, you know, uh, demand there and, and we're starting to cover that as well. Um, additionally, because of that, we're also seeing, you know, from the institutional uh, trading community, both uh, in Europe and Asia, uh, demand as well. And that's something that, you know, uh, we think is going to continue over the next, uh, you know, six to 18 months. Um, we see a lot of European firms looking at our data for um, after hours um, and, you know, overnight in, in Asia. So uh, we think there's a lot of opportunity there. Um, and, um, you know, they're definitely in, in those two, um, two regions. And I think as we kind of think about, and we talked a lot about in our sessions about how each business sort of feeds onto itself. Um, Mike, there was a question just around, obviously we saw a lot of volatility uh, last year and, and Dan and Jason and Cromwell all spoke to that, but maybe you can just talk a little bit about some of the early things we're seeing in 2022 and kind of how that um, ties in with some of those trends that Matt was just speaking to. Sure, you know, although last, year in Q1 was obviously the highest volumes we ever saw in over-the-counter trading. The volumes in this Q1 are, are down about 32%, but from you know, our participation in the market, we, we've continued to grow our overall market share on the ECN. And you know, we've been able to continue to advance our, our new products into you know, being able to trade um, additional securities and be able to continue to grow that market share. So I think we're, we're well positioned you know, as market volumes come back and over the counter to, you know, be the place of choice for our subscribers to execute transactions. I think that's helpful just to frame up sort of how things are shifting, but also the, the types of things that Dan was talking about earlier of how we've really set ourselves up to be prepared to handle those, those differences and those different um, trading strategies as well. Um, one of the questions that, uh, that just came in, um, Jason, I think I'll direct this one to you, um, which is really around um, companies becoming public later in their life cycle. Um, and therefore, um, you know, just kind of looking at that dynamic and kind of how we position ourselves based um, in and around how companies might view entering the, the public market. So maybe Jason, I'll start with you and then Cromwell maybe um, add some additional remarks from your perspective on that kind of going public process. Sure, thanks, Christy. I think, you know, there's a lot of press about companies staying private longer. Um, I think what's missed in that is companies are actually choosing alternative routes to access public markets um, and not as much of a discussion around, around that phenomenon. Uh, our markets are tailored for early stage growth companies uh, that maybe historically would have stayed private longer and waited for a big bang on a national exchange, um, but in essence are using our markets to learn how to become kind of those future uh, public companies. So we position ourselves, you know, in, in some cases as public venture capital, if you will, right, for those early stage companies where the benefits of being public exist, where you can go out um, tell your story, capture investment, grow your business without some of the complexity, risk, cost, burden of a huge national exchange. 
um, and learn how to grow yourself up to that point so that when you want to become public in what the press calls being public, um, you're ready to take that jump uh, to, to a bigger national exchange. So we're actually seeing, and I think Cromwell in his presentation saw the numbers, right? The number of companies that are accessing our markets continues to grow. Uh, those are public companies. Um, it's just the alternative route that they're taking in order to get there. And Cromwell, there's, there's some maybe additional thoughts or color you just want to add around kind of that that cycle of going public that Jason spoke to, and also the, the journey that companies are on, much like our own, um, to really learn how to be um, good public reporting companies and have the right governance and, and standards in place. Thanks, thanks, Christy. That's, you know, there's always been a debate since I started in public markets about how do we balance the needs of capital formation and compliance from a risk entity size and cost perspective. You know, we no longer live in a one size fits all world. And the how, so what we think about a lot is how do we offer public company different stairways of standards to grow upward on? And mm -hmm. instead of having the big package that you buy at once, our goal, our goal is, is pretty straightforward is to provide building blocks. And that understanding is, is different than a national securities exchange, but it's more forward-looking. Forward and, and that's, as we build it, what we've seen is our standards we built, we've seen more regulatory recognitions of as the marketplace has recognized those standards, and that can increase value to companies of being public. I think that's really helpful and, and also just gives the perspective of we ourselves have been on that, that same journey um, in terms of establishing ourselves within the public market. Um, just as we kind of switch gears a little bit, um, but again, Dan, this is, uh, this is over to you. It's just a, uh, a bit of a uh, look at expanding um, the thoughts around 211. So I know you touched on this a little bit in your remarks, but we did get a question just around um, you know, given it was adopted last year, how does that drive growth into 2022 um, as you think about seeing more companies join the market? Um, and is that impacted at all by things like, you know, a recession or rising inflation rates? Well, it's, it's a good question. And, and I think it's important to address it both in, in the prior panel and in this discussion. Uh, I mean, in terms of growth and, and how we see that working in 2022, um, think about 2021 as setting a baseline. So what I was referencing earlier was this flurry of activity that led up to the compliance date last year, but that now becomes the standard. So in terms of our growth possibilities into 2022, it's really building on what we already established last year, making sure our processes and procedures are, are as smooth as possible and allowing more companies to onboard as they see the value created by those companies that, that ensured their compliance last year. Um, I think things like a recession or inflation or other macroeconomic events of the type that we were referencing earlier will always have some degree of impact on, on how the market operates and how investors think about how they want to interact with companies. Um, but from our uh, sort of silo here in terms of the, the regulations that are very specific to what we do, 15C211 will continue to set that baseline. It will continue to be um, the mark that companies need to meet in order to remain publicly quoted on the market. Um, and typically, even in times of economic distress, that's what companies want to do. They want to be able to, to have their disclosure out there, be transparent, um, and communicate as much as possible with investors. So um, with that in mind, I think 2022 sets itself up as, as a year of um, seeing that part of the business grow. And, and Jason, is that something that you're seeing as we um, look at, you know, the first just kind of coming out of the first quarter of Q1? Um, yes, I think, you know, when you get into times of economic uncertainty um, and when you overlay kind of 15C211, what you're seeing is companies that are being much more proactive in wanting to engage investors. You know, there was a saying when I started, stocks are sold, they're not bought, right? That's more than ever, companies are going out and trying to make sure they're doing what they can uh, to, 
to grow their shareholder base, their investor base, and 15C211 is that benchmark in order to be able to do that uh, in the over-the-counter market here in the U.S. For international companies, it's even more important. Um, as a large number of investors that use our markets are retail investors, uh, being able to access U.S. retail investors in times of uncertainty to, to mitigate a lot of the velocity that happens during those times has become increasingly important. And being able to evidence their investability through, through rules like 15C211 are, are you know, a significant part of that. Um, in terms of some of the other kind of questions that are coming in, I think um, this one I'll turn over, um, Antonia, to you and to Cromwell. Um, obviously, we talked about our recent acquisition of Blue Sky Data Corp. So we've gotten a question just on any further color that we might be able to, to provide on that acquisition. Um, and then kind of bridging that to sort of a, a longer term thought about how we kind of think through um, our overall acquisition strategy. So maybe, um, Antonia, I'll start with you and then Cromwell, maybe you can pick up from there. Certainly, thank you, Christy. Uh, in general, when we look at acquisitions, we, clear, we certainly look for opportunities that further enhance and strengthen that flywheel effect that uh, Cromwell and others uh, touched on. And Blue Sky uh, Data Corp is no exception. In terms of the specific question around the economics of that acquisition, uh, Blue Sky Data Corp has, has been a leader in its um, in its space of delivering Blue Sky compliance data for 30 years and has operated profitably over that long period of time. So we are looking forward to bring on board its clients and revenue. Um, but in addition, we're also expecting to realize efficiencies in how we leverage our technology capabilities to deliver the same data set more efficiently to the existing client base. So we do expect to realize certain synergies on the cost side and overall see not only the strategic benefits from this acquisition that Cromwell touched on and others touched on in terms of expanding our capabilities into state securities law to augment and enhance our federal level compliance data, but we do expect to see a positive financial impact from the acquisition as well. And Cromwell, maybe you could kind of speak to the broader um, acquisition strategy. Yep. This is one example. So, so, so Blue Sky Data was an acquisition that I would like to be able to do one every six months. It's timed well. The entrepreneur who founded it is, has, has built a strong business with, with recurring revenue and has a high quality product. It's a smaller company though, so we can bring to it uh, our better technology platform. And we're actually moving the, the process of, of creating the data into our platform very quickly. So it's a big win from that side. However, we get to take the people and, and the knowledge and, and the domain knowledge to improve our product and also work on our overall data quality picture. So it's, it's, it's a very positive uh, acquisition from a commercial standpoint for us is, now of course the entrepreneur knew they had a good business, so they sold it, we had to get to what was a, a fair price. She was a quite good negotiator too. So, but what we've what we have now is a product that takes a very complex set of regulations and makes it easier for broker dealers to be in compliance and we get to take that critical mass and expand it out and have that tool set of helping brokers take complex regulations and be in compliance uh, and scale it across a network and then this the the second part is because platforms are much more valuable if you have a multi-sided effect. By our going out to the corporate community of issuers of equity and debt securities, helping them understand Blue Sky will give them the opportunity to go into, to, to be compliant in more states, to take the extra steps, to provide the disclosure, to put the credentials out. And so it becomes a win-win situation where the market becomes more efficient and more compliant. 
And that, so that's exciting. And because a good chunk of the securities are traded over the counter, while we'll cover listed uh, equity and debt securities, it expands the access points for securities and the, the overall level of compliance with securities regulation to the market in an, in an efficient manner and technology driven. Now, the second side is I would say that's not every acquisition we're going to see. We're going to see a range of acquisitions that, and there's going to be different opportunities. When we initially purchased the National Quotation Bureau, it was a turnaround situation and it was a replatforming and it was changing the, the fundamental service provided to clients rather drastically. But by doing that, we were able to put the business on a path to growth. And you know, for us, we look at acquisitions is, is what does it do to increase our product suite, uh, strengthen our platform, or expand the skill set of our people? And if we do those thoughtfully and commercially, uh, we should over time have a portfolio of, of purchases, investments, and organic growth products that grow shareholder value over time. I think that's that's really helpful to both frame sort of, you know, the the reasons behind um, the Blue Sky acquisition, but also to look at how we think about acquisitions um, overall and as we move forward to the future. Um, the next question, um, actually, Jason, looks like this one is is for you at least as a starting point. Um, and it's really around talking a little bit about pipeline. And in this case, rather than talking about the private to public pipeline, really looking at um, the potential pipeline as it exists of companies that have maybe, you know, with a potential economic downturn, you know, are facing um, the question of whether it makes sense to come to our markets, QX, for example, rather than remain on a, on a national securities exchange. So maybe you can just speak to a little bit of that process and kind of how you view that overall. Yeah, over the last, gosh, five to 10 years, you know, that's been an ever growing part of, of the pipeline um, is as our markets have expanded, as we've gained more regulatory recognition, as, you know, as everybody on this call has said, we've increased the, the product suite, the breadth and depth of the distribution of the information. Um, companies have always taken a look at whether or not um, being listed on a national exchange meets the needs of that company at, that, at any particular moment. Certainly one of those factors is cost, um, but regulatory burden and others certainly come up. Um, when markets turn down or where we hit a, a recession or something that, that causes uh, companies to, to think longer and harder about what they're getting out of their public market, we absolutely do see uh, growth you know, accelerated growth in the pipeline. Certainly you also see companies that, you know, no longer want to be on that wheel of chasing meeting in exchange listing standards. So not wanting to do reverse splits to meet the, the price requirement, not needing to do all of the things um, that come with being on a national exchange. So, you know, the, the, the short answer to the question is yes, absolutely when, when markets turn, we see uh, the impact through increased pipeline, but that's not something that's limited to just a market downturn. It's something that, as we've grown, um, has been part of our strategy for business development uh, all along. And I think that's that's helpful again to understand that there's there's multiple sides of of the equation, whether that's the private to public process, whether that's the uplisting process, or whether that's looking at um, companies choosing our markets um, over or for a national exchange. Um, Liz, I thought I might just turn to you for a second, because um, we've obviously talked a lot in our remarks about 15C211 um, and the ongoing implications of that. Um, your team obviously sees, um, you know, this from kind of the, the groundswell up. Um, you know, we just came on a bunch of annual filing cycles and things like that. So can you just speak a little bit to what your team saw as we hit that kind of post six month mark um, from the implementation of 211? Sure. Um, as several people have mentioned, we spent uh, last last year leading up to the implementation date of uh, the Rule 15C2 amendments, 15C211 amendments, just sort of onboarding new clients onto our platform. And 
um, working with them to provide the required disclosure under 15C211. And now we have to uh, continue to serve those clients. And um, we are just coming off a large filing cycle, the 1231 annual filing cycle, just, just finishing that up. And it's typically our busiest time of the year. Um, it's gone remarkably smoothly. And the, what, we're, what we're seeing is the vast majority of the companies that selected last year to, um, to have OTC markets play this role and confirm compliance with 211 to maintain a public market are continuing to provide the required disclosure. We, we are, it's just, it's going very smoothly. Companies are providing the disclosure that they need to provide to maintain their markets. That's, that's what, what we're, that's what we're seeing so far. We also, you know, we continue to see interest from new um, issuers who are, who are, you know, inquiring about how, how they can sort of come into the, the, the lit markets as well and um, make their disclosure available, newly available to investors. And I think Cromwell, that speaks to one of the um, things that you often talk about is really just the ESG factor um, of, you know, making sure that companies have good corporate governance um, in place and are continuing to meet um, those deadlines and those standards and making that information as transparent and as available to investors as possible. Thank, thanks, Christy. The, I, we talk about our regulatory recognitions a lot, but those regulatory recognitions aren't for every company on our platform. And that's important to understand is our goal is to create a market where investors can identify and properly price opportunity and risk. And, and that's, and so what that does is companies need to earn and own their public reputation. It's the company's reputation on the platform. It's the company's disclosure. It's the company's governance. It's the company's credentials. And we're the network that helps distribute those and digitalize that and provide a continuously updating stream of information, which then feeds into the market pricing process. And that's what an efficient market is. It's supply demand with information for the market to move from the short-term dynamics of popularity to the long-term scale of value. And, you know, we look at it is governance and good corporate citizenship is on the front burner for every company and is not going away. Because for companies that want to be public and successful over the long-term, they need to practice a form of sustainable capitalism that's connected to their community, delivers value, and also complies with securities laws and, and, and other rules and regulations wherever they operate. And our goal as a market operator is to help those companies distribute that information into the market, their information. That's very helpful, Cromwell. Thank you. Um, I think as we kind of um, look at a few more of the questions that have come in, um, Dan, this, this one's for you. Um, obviously, there's a lot going on right now within the SEC um, and within the um, regulatory space. I know we obviously talked a bit in your remarks earlier about our legislative and our regulatory agenda, um, but maybe you can just touch on um, what some of those more critical pieces are for our markets that the SEC currently has um, under review, or at least a few highlights anyway? Sure. They, yeah, they are prolific lately. Uh, you know, last year, I was wondering when the, the rule proposals were going to start coming, and, and they turned on the faucet. Uh, and so a, a lot of things have come out recently. You know, the things that impact our market and that we pay close attention to um, are largely around disclosure. So there are climate disclosure proposals out there, cybersecurity disclosure proposals out there. We look at that both to try to understand uh, what our SEC reporting companies are going to need to, to include in their disclosure, how folks might react to that, and whether that's something we should adopt or, or, or pieces of that, 
we get a nice process of learning by watching the, the comment period and watching implementation of, of some of those rules. Um, similarly, the SEC put out a rule proposal regarding the definition of an exchange and looking at how trading systems operate and really with the goal of expanding the pool of organizations and, and trading facilities that qualify as an ATS. Um, and so we're, we're gonna welcome more people into the, the place where we sit as a regulated market operator. Uh, and so seeing how the SEC implements rules like that is also very core and very key um, to, to what we look at. There are really new ones almost every day, um, but I think focusing on, on those two things, that those that impact kind of how we deal with our regulators as a regulated entity and how our regulators are thinking about expanding or, or minimizing those, um, those responsibilities and how companies that might be included on our markets can, can be a part of um, what the SEC is thinking. That, that's, that's really where we're gonna spend a lot of our time. And certainly that's a, it's a passion area for everyone that's on this call is how are we you know, really helping the companies that sit on our markets, the broker dealers that trade with us, our market data subscribers, um, you know, make the most out of um, their ability to, to be here with us. Um, as we kind of wrap things out, we've got just a couple more questions coming in. Um, if anyone's been holding off and not asking a question, I would invite you now as we start to wind things down to add it into the Q&A module. Um, but the next question that came in, um, and I think Matt, you touched a little bit upon this, um, but this is from more of a corporate service perspective. Um, the question was around just um, you know, Asia and China as core markets um, or what we're seeing in terms of the potential for those markets um, as, we, as we look forward. So maybe Jason, I'll, I'll start with you and then Matt, to the extent you wanna add anything further, that would be great. Thanks, Christy. Uh, certainly from a, from a corporate service perspective, uh, Asia is a market uh, on which we plan to focus. Um, China, the, I think the, met, the question was China slash Asia. So I don't know if that's both or, or all, um, but certainly countries with public markets, Japan, uh, Hong Kong, you know, Tokyo, Hong Kong, um, Singapore, our markets where we're looking, where there's a tremendous opportunity for us on the corporate services side, as well as tremendous opportunities for companies. Again, back to my earlier uh, response about wanting to access U.S. investors and have a public market. Um, you know, we are the beneficiary of being a secondary market for a significant number of companies that are primarily quoted on their home markets. So if you look at Tokyo or Hong Kong or Singapore, um, and those exchanges, as an example, to be able to have an OTCQX or QB um, quote and to be able to access U.S. investors through um, their home market disclosure is really advantageous. And as you look, um, you know, China is something that comes up a lot as we've looked at what's going on with, with single listed Chinese companies on the exchanges here. Um, being able to re-domicile and become publicly traded in their home market, um, Hong Kong as the example, um, but to be able to still maintain that secondary quotation on our market and be able to access those investors or maintain their investor relations strategy to the investors they already have um, is something we spend a lot of time looking at uh, and are focused on. And Certainly, Matt, you know, as we, you know, bring on more and more companies from some of these different regions and we see the trading community interested in um, those markets specifically, obviously that opens doors for you from a market data perspective. Right. I mean, you know, Asia gets <clears throat> thrown around as a region, but it's, you know, there's so many different, obviously, you know, uh, countries within it and different markets, right? So they all have a lot of opportunity from a data perspective. So it really feeds on what Jason was saying. Um, also, you know, the growth of the retail investor, the growth of the, the middle class in these places, they're interested in trading, it's getting easier. Um, and so that's, you know, that's bringing a lot of opportunity on the data side as well. Yep, and, and Bruce, as we think about sort of the, the technology, obviously to serve both those companies, our broker dealer subscribers, as well as our, our market data subscribers, um, maybe you can just talk a little bit about, you know, the investment that we can continue to make in our technology um, in order to, to make those things happen. Sure, Christy. We are, we're constantly increasing our technology spend year over year. Um, that's in both infrastructure, personnel, development, 
I think Blue Sky is a good example, as Cromwell pointed out before. Uh, we continue to increase our systems to, to handle two to three X capacity. So they're never running at the top of the stack, so to speak. Um, a good example, you know, year over year, we are constantly upgrading our broker dealer uh, community uh, offerings so that we enhance um, the capability of, 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 of the company's value there. So at the end, we're a FinTech company and we're always ensuring that our technology is both scalable, resilient, uh, and most certainly reliable. So I think guys, that about brings us to the end of our Q&A session, um, but Cromwell, maybe we'll fill up it to you if there's any closing remarks or anything else you just wanted to highlight. Um, and while I give everyone an opportunity, if there's any last breaking questions. Thanks, Christy. You know, I'd like to, there's a big long-term trend, which is transparency and technology has increased information availability and diversity of investor access points to public markets. And that's really highlighted the importance of active investing. You know, the stock markets, when I was starting out, active investing was the top of, of the chain and passive index investing created an incredible product where investors can put their, can put their money as savings in a diversified portfolio and, and free ride off the market forces. However, that only works if there's active investing and there's an ecosystem feeding the large index companies all the way to the beginning of the capital formation process. And so that conversation with regulators, how do we keep improving that environment and increasing information availability and a diversity of access points to the public markets? Brokers, have, brokers offer lots of different business models and pricing strategies to investors and information availability. So that's a big change. And because of that, that great information distribution is the, the value of going and being public as the long-term trend of transparency, of companies becoming more transparent, becoming more connected to their community, wanting to have their community be investors in their company is, and that's demonstrated from direct listings, it's demonstrated from SPACs, it is a changeover. And our challenge is how do we balance the complexity, time burden, cost for companies over their life cycles? And how do we tailor it for different companies, whether they're global companies, community banks, early startups, Bitcoin trusts, and solve those problems so that there is good information for investors in the market and that companies own that reputation and can earn, earn a reputation or be priced properly for their own risks and, and putting that together. And that's always, that's, always, that's always our challenge because we have public companies, we have investors, we have broker dealers who, have, who have to, are highly regulated and, and need to meet standards and in a very competitive market. And finally, that conversation with regulators, that the markets are moving in the right direction. And those, those are the things that, that we work on. And as we get work on those, we're also building out the technology platform to actually, uh, and the people platform to accomplish those commercial needs. I think that's an, an excellent place to wrap up our um, discussion today. Obviously, we've talked a lot about that continued trajectory, wh whether that be from a regulatory agenda perspective or from a business perspective. Um, so I'd just like to thank all of you um, in attendance today. Uh, you will receive a copy um, of both the, um, the Q&A session as well as the previous sessions. Um, and we look forward to continued dialogue with all of you and the ability to answer your questions moving forward. So thank you very much for joining us for our OTC Markets Investor Day. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>